Greetings, mammalians, and welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard, freshly returned from Austin, Texas, where we were hanging out together. We have a lot of catching up to do. We're basically living in each other's pockets for like a week. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, let's, uh, let's do some remote catching up. That's right. I feel so lonely now. Uh, <clears throat> so w- what happened while you were here in Austin? What were the highlights? Uh, for the pot, I mean, the, the actual highlights were probably the legit country on Western dancing. That was superb. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I really enjoyed the sushi place we went to, Otako. That's right. Otako. Yeah. A secret Otoko. kind of hidden food. Yeah. food. Uh huh. Yeah. That was nice. Uh, we played a game of poker. We're going to play you an excerpt from a two hour poker tournament at the end of today's episode. Okay. For me, yeah. And we also, I got to watch you try on the Apple Vision Pro goggles. We got a little bit of video about that in today's episode mm-hmm. as well. We'll share uh, some perspectives on the Vision Pro. And we took a trip to the Austin Wise offices. Wise is one of your favorite companies right now. It's in your King of the Jungle portfolio challenge as a position. And it's how you got me to pay you my poker debt. (laughs) (laughs) He sent me a fine number of dollars. Yes, thank you. (laughs) And you're also kind enough to uh, launder my dirty Tahoe poker winnings for me and send them over (laughs) to Wise2. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so first up, we went to the Apple Store right near where the Wise offices are in the domain in Austin. You put on the goggles and what happened? Well, let's take a look at a quick video from that day where I give a bit of a blow by blow on my immediate reactions. All right. So this is Monkey and Badger coming at you from right outside the Apple store (laughs) where Badger has just seen the future. I've just spent uh, 20 minutes in the Apple Vision Pro demo. Yep. And I was looking at you wondering what the hell is going on in there. So. What happened? It's uh, it's impressive. I've got an Oculus, so I've seen like a bad version of this technology. Uh, so the good, it, the in- resolution is incredible. Uh, like, uh, yeah, there was like an 8K video I think I watched in like stereoscopic, so so it looks 3D, uh, and the, the refresh rate, like you're looking at a real scene. It's almost as good as like standing in the street looking at that car there. The audio is very immersive. There's nothing in your ear, there's no induction, but they've just got some very high-tech headphones on the strap, uh, like speakers that last in US. You couldn't hear me. You couldn't hear what I was hearing, right? Zero. But it was loud and fully immersive. Sound, so looked and sounded beautiful. The gesture stuff is very intuitive. Like I figured it out within like 30 seconds. It all just kind of makes sense. Uh, the eye tracking is spot on. Very, very, very impressive. You just look where you want to, and then you just, do this like gesture and you can sort of do this gesture to pull stuff apart and scroll and expand it yeah it just works i think all our viewers have one question only on their mind mm-hmm. are you now an apple fanboy <laughs> nah, are you, how many of, how many of these are you going to order as soon as <laughs> as soon as you know i'm not looking <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, why it's um it's beautiful technology. I mean, I'll, I'll put aside my Apple reservations because I just don't like the ecosystem. This is, that's the best. I've, I've only used the Oculus, but that's leagues better. It's heavy though. I was uh, gonna, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. maybe I could have mm-hmm. had the strap a little higher on my head so it was better supported. But even in like a 20 minute demo, after like 15 minutes in, I was like feeling it, like sitting on my forehead and being actually quite uncomfortable. But the resolution of this was so good that I think it would, probably feel more natural than the oculus like there's definitely what like a one thing you there was a bit where we we're looking at like safari we we're reading a web page and like very easy on the eye you could just read the web page like i've got a piece of paper or like a, like a computer screen in front of me if i tried to do that in the oculus it'd be impossible like the the resolution is good enough the letters are all kind of blurry um and you get like a headache doing that sort of thing so you could absolutely use this to work and then you know, create your environment and have like spreadsheets over here floating beside you and like a browser window or maybe like YouTube playing over here. So uh, yeah, very, very interesting. You know, if you're a trader, you could replace 
you know, these like banks and banks of monitors with just a headset and like, you know, that would work. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks for taking me for the demo. That was very cool. Okay. So it was pretty cool. Uh, and maybe just to summarize all of that waffle, superb resolution. The eye tracking is really good. The gesturing is very intuitive. I like it. You could definitely use this for work if it wasn't so damn heavy. Um, you will see in the video, I've got like a line on my forehead where the weight of this thing was bearing down on me. I think I recommended you maybe hit the gym and do some neck exercises. That could be <laughs> that could be one one solution. To me, it's curious that this it remains curious that this is the one Apple gadget that I was not dying to get immediately. I don't know if I'm just getting older and less enthralled by new fancy toys, but uh, it doesn't seem necessary in the way that the iPhone seemed necessary in the way even an iPad would change the way I, I computed. So maybe your comments about the neck weight, uh, maybe lack of developer products that were beyond, you know, cool for the moment, but how would I use it? Like, for example, when I was watching you be on the moon, I could see what the Apple uh, host was seeing on his iPad. In other words, I was seeing what you were seeing and I saw you looking up and down and there you are on the surface of the moon. Cool, but not actionable. Not like yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it, they, it's a good implementation of what's called six degrees of freedom. Like you can look around, but you can also move around in the space. And that was like a rendered environment. So that worked pretty well. Um, like the technology is there, just people need now need to build uh, applications for it. So there might be games or maybe Google Earth is a great example of a really immersive, fantastic application. That stuff will appear on the Vision Pro at some point. Yeah, cool. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, last point being, are you going to get one? The answer is still no, mostly because I'm not an Apple guy. I just don't want Apple tech in my house. I don't buy it. But it made me think a bit more hard about maybe getting rid of my Oculus CV1 and perhaps buying the latest, greatest Oculus Quest headset, um, which is supposed to be almost as good as the Vision Pro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so while we were at the domain here in Austin, we took a 15-minute walk to where the WISE headquarters were located. How did that come about? That did um, I have been tweeting every day about my worst and my greatest investments and WISE falls into one of my greatest investments. High conviction stock for me, love the product, love the account as a business and a personal user. And I noticed a couple of weeks ago that my spare dollars I was keeping in my business account, I kind of don't pay too much attention to. And it's not a lot of money, if I'm honest, it's probably about $10,000 just sat parked in an account. And I noticed the other day I'd earned nearly three and a half thousand dollars in interest income because Wise lets me invest that. And so I tweeted about that to say, oh, this is interesting. This product really does work. And I got a retweet from their CEO, Christo Carmen. And so that led to a conversation with the Wise chaps in Austin, their newest North American office and their future sort of US headquarters. So yeah, we had a really fun visit. I think let's not say too much about it though, because we learned some interesting stuff and Wise very kindly have agreed to join us on the Seven Investing podcast. So we'll be recording an interview with uh, a member of their leadership team in the next week or two, hopefully, and that'll appear on Seven Investing and we'll probably cross post it to uh, our Wall Street Wildlife podcast too. The one thing I would like to say, Badger, is... Back in what I would call pre-internet, pre-everything being available at your fingertips on the internet, there is the old school Peter Lynchian strategy of buy or invest in the things you yourself know or can touch, which I don't know how much selectivity bias there is in that perspective, because I'm sure there's a lot of investments people use that didn't quite work out. But this is, I guess in the favorable side of that equation, where by going to the office and meeting the people, there's a sense of uh, ownership that starts to happen, like a, like a 
oh, these are real people making a real thing. And then you begin to use it more and believe it, believe in it more. And I was excited to open up my account that I had forgotten about and, and, you know, use it to transfer the money to you. And it makes a difference as an investor. It, it's not a, it's a immaterial thing in one sense, like sure, it's an opinion and you like the product, but in another one, another sense, when the bumps eventually happen, if you have the conviction, conviction of having used it yourself, it is so much easier to hold on and let the story play out. Yeah. So question back to you then, a bit like the Vision Pro, are you going to become a wise shareholder? Believe it or not, I looked up the ticker again, <laughs> well, because we had a bunch of ticker issues because there, there are many. And unfortunately, it's not available on Robinhood, which sucks okay. because that's I condensed all my all my accounts to Robinhood. And I didn't check SoFi, but I know I'm not going to buy in SoFi because you have it and I'm not going to that that would not uh yeah that that's just gaming reasons but okay uh it's in my i put it in my maybe queue for for future investments it certainly has my attention great stuff let me remind you of all the tickers though because you might find one of them is available there's the london listing which i own which is wise w-i-s-e but there's also two different flavors of the adr so one is W-I-Z-E-Y, and the other one, I think, is W-F-P-L-C. So you might find one of those available on Robinhood. The former is the one I tried, W-I-Z-E-Y. That did not work okay. on Robinhood. Right. Uh, I'll, look into the, I'll look into the other one. So more to come about our visit to Wise. We yeah, got a great photo out of it, though. We look, yeah. <laughs> we look like two wild animals in a corporate office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they were very chill they let us get a nice photo in their lobby well uh and here it is indeed if you enjoy what luke and i are putting out there as a beginning investor investing curious or as a seasoned professional please subscribe to us on youtube it helps all the wheels turn and you could also follow us on Twitter. I am at seven flying platypus. And I am at seven Luke Hallard. You could also find us at wallstreetwildlife.com, which has all the links for you to follow, including the latest update into our King of the Jungle portfolio challenge. Very good. Now there's a, uh, there's a stock I know you're a big fan of that you don't currently own in your King of the Jungle portfolio, and that's Tesla. Do you want to tell us what we just saw about Tesla in the news today? This is a great test case uh, crossroad for investors trying to balance short-term versus long-term outlook. This morning, the stock opened up something like down 8% because deliveries were, I would say, substantially lower than estimated. So I think as I was poking around, estimates were something around 415,000 cars, more or less. And they came in at something like 386,000. Wow. So it was uh, not only, right, not only did they miss the estimates, but uh, it was a year over year decline. So well, that's, that's, uh, that's significant. Yeah, it was, it, it was pretty significant. So th it's it's not that the details don't matter, but for this discussion, what, I, what I'm more interested in is how what is an investor supposed to make of what I experience as uh, deep ambivalence in this moment? The numbers are pointing the wrong direction. So that's an obvious negative, and, and all the bears are out in full force. And they're saying things like, oh, stock is going down to 100. Relatively speaking, it's now at one called 165. So they're saying because the fundamental business appears to be either slowing down, running into trouble or maturing or some other combination of troubles, you could add China to that. Uh, you could add Elon's potential politicizing of the company to that. 
the numbers in the end are what, you know, that's the most concentrated data point. So in this moment, going in the wrong direction, that's on one hand. And on the other hand, my continued belief in the long-term story that this company has a shot at becoming the world's most valuable because of its manufacturing excellence, its AI, uh, its investments in Optimus and developing AI, and obviously unlocking everything that full self-driving vehicles would help Tesla unlock. But that's all in the future. So the question I have to you is in this moment, if I don't use technical analysis and I don't look at charts in that hocus pocus, am I a buyer? Or let me rephrase, are you a buyer? Are you uh, holding tight? Or are you potentially a seller? I would want to look at these numbers in more detail to make that call. And I haven't uh, reflected on that news item. Do you happen to know what... Uh, the other big auto manufacturers' numbers look like in terms of their year-over-year deliveries. Because if they're also down, then my inclination would be to say that this is probably more a inflation-slash-high interest rate impact and households are perhaps being a bit conservative and maybe putting off a big purchase like a car until they feel a bit more flush with cash. This is why I feel this is such a hard decision for investors to make. It's hard for me to truly understand what the source of these of this slowdown is. I forgot like you know the macro picture as you know I think is fairly bleak. Side note, Tesla uh, I believe gave an explanation one of which is that the gigafactory in Berlin was shut down for some period of time due to arson. So there's that piece. But so I think I think it's actually too complicated to know at this moment from from the outside. A personal anecdote, like I now have my order in for my replacement model three. And all I was in uh, the States. So I didn't want the car to come while I was away. I wanted to be here so I could go through the whole collection process methodically. And the whole time I kept like checking my order on the app it kept saying basically like same month delivery. And I was putting in this full spec I wanted. And it's only, so I put that off. I waited till mid-March to put in the actual order, expecting to, you know, have it now essentially. Uh, And then when I got, when I put the real order in and paid the deposit, it's giving me a delivery date of like somewhere between June and August. Like, I don't know how Hmm. they screwed that up. Can I tell you, I, I guess, I guess I want to bring this to your attention for our listeners, because this to me seems like a legitimate clusterfuck, might be a little bit too too strong a, a term, but uh, wanting to invest in a company that will one day be the biggest and then having all kinds of complicated reasons not to. My own decision is to, at this moment, do nothing. And mm-hmm. I suspect that things are going to get worse before they get better because of all these other issues, namely being these are still very expensive vehicles. And if macro is in fact becoming a problem, then their primary uh, selling environments, you can't escape, you can't escape that. You can't escape the, this being a luxury vehicle. And I'm starting to suspect the magic trick that's going to eventually reignite Tesla is FSD. But it's nowhere near, I think, monetization in in a way that is um, like a must-have item. You know, the thing that will justify these high, this high, still high valuation for Tesla. In other words, it's yeah. still a gimmick, right? I mean, not a gimmick, but as you as you experience with me, right? Like it's it's really really nice, but you can't relax while using it so it's not must have so it's more still in the early adopter stage so until it becomes the kind of thing where you could take a nap in the back seat as a way to justify the twelve thousand dollars or whatever it costs it be it's still niche and therefore not what will move the needle but i think if i if i remember correctly elon musk is basically betting the future of the company on just this so we're still early in the adoption cycle. You got, you got like Waymo's running their way around some cities in the US with no driver. Um, 
And so I guess the regulatory environment in the US is such that the regulators are more open to these sort of technologies. It's it's just never going to happen in the in Europe and the UK. Like we're at least five to ten years out just from a regulatory perspective. But as you said, like you gave me a demo of the very latest software, 12.3 FSD. It was really impressive, much more impressive than I expected based on my crummy yeah. FSD I have in the UK. Um, but as you said, right, if you could sit and read a book while the car drives you to like the university campus, you'd pay for it. But until that point, and that point isn't today, like, you know, what are you really paying for? So one question that I think is outstanding at this moment in Tesla's trajectory is, was it a huge mistake on Elon's part to not bring out the uh, cheap version, cheaper version of a Tesla out to the mass market? Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, all the rebate. I'm not talking about lowering the cost of a Tesla via tax rebates and savings in uh, electricity versus gas. Um, I'm saying uh, Tesla went premium with the Model S first and then, you know, higher performance Model 3s and then back to the Cybertruck. Oh, and of course the Model X, right? Yeah. It seems like potentially as far as the strategy goes, companies like the one you're familiar with, BYD, in China are growing massively because they are much cheaper, correct? I think the Model 3 is still cheaper than its equivalent BYD car, but certainly BYD are launching much cheaper models into like the Chinese market. Yeah, so there's no, I mean, I don't know, this might be Tesla's saving grace or this might be what they're finally starting to realize that the only move they can make next is to release the mass market vehicle that's i don't know sticker price of i don't know twenty thousand, if possible but delaying it this far it remains to be seen but i wonder if that's not uh, a potentially disastrous decision i don't know i don't know i i think it's too early to count them out on their strategy of you know maybe cybertruck was a bit of distraction and we saw a cybertruck go past us in austin and I goggled at how awful it looked. Um, like, it's not for me, but there's a market for it. Uh, and there is something to be said for staying in the news with, like, really interesting product lines. But all that stuff is probably irrelevant, right? The the Model 3 and, the, like, the Model Y is the world's best-selling car now, I think, in, yeah. globally. Um, like, there's no argument that they're not selling these things far faster than they can manufacture them. Um yeah, I mean, for me, it, I'm, I'm holding, I'm not selling or buying, but for me, it comes back to like what, what's happening to their competitors. Because it's feel, it seems like the last time I looked at the numbers a few months ago, Tesla had a stranglehold over like Mercedes, BMW, all the others in terms of just cutting their margins and their cost to the bone, being able to put out premium vehicles at a price that their competitors can't touch. It's, uh, I don't know what this says, but chart wise, Luke, we're at the same price now as Tesla was on September of 20. So it's been something like four years of flat for the stock price, which. Yeah, but you look, that's looking at the stock price. That's not looking at any business fundamentals. Right. Like the company is significantly stronger than it was in 2020. Yeah, so that, I guess one way of interpreting that is that back in 2020, the share price had gotten really ahead of itself. If sure. four years later, after massive growth, the price is still the same. But, you know, in hindsight, this reminds me a little bit of the NVIDIA moments we had not that long ago, where NVIDIA stock plummeted because of, what was it, the pr problems with uh, crypto chips and it hit a low of whatever, 110 per share and all this fudding. But those people who really understood the company and where it was going made bank. This could be one of those moments. It's just really, really murky right now. I guess these numbers have just come out. We both need a bit of time to digest them, but I do plan to do that. I'm potentially back in buying mode with Tesla. So if I like what I see, 
uh, this could be a great opportunity to add. I think the next data point for me will be to listen very, very hard to what the company says on its next earnings report uh, for any inclination about what the future roadmap looks like. My suspicion on a little bit of the technical analysis side is that right now the angle of the stock uh, is down and I don't see that changing anytime soon unless we get a real fundamental shift in what the company says it's doing. So to be seen, but it could drop. For those of you who are uncertain, I, I would I would just call I would just say this. Just because it fell a lot today does not mean it can't go down a lot lower. And that because the other thing to remember is the people, the what moves the stock price in a company like Tesla is not retail investors. It's what big institutions decide to do who are holding hundreds, tens, millions of dollars in this. And if they see a stock going nowhere for the next couple of years, they very well might elect, elect to sell. And then that, you know, that spirals. So caution is very much warranted at this juncture. Should we, uh, should we talk about another uh, line that went down pretty sharply? It was one of our chip account in the poker <laughs> tournament we played at the end of my Austin mm-hmm. visit. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's cut away to a little video and we'll, uh, we'll see how the tournament played out. You and I and uh, your beautiful wife, Cersei. Okay. Now it's red. Welcome to another impromptu episode of Wall Street Wildlife with Christoph. The where's the monkey? There's a monkey in this deck of cards somewhere. <laughs> Christoph Leopard Pikasti and Luke the Badger Hallard, and we're joined by Christoph's zookeeper, Cersei. Hi. <laughs> and now I'm hiding. <laughs> what are we playing, Christoph? We are playing Texas No Limit Hold'em for pride pride honor, and dollars dignity pride and, and dollars yep pride and dollars winner takes all tournament style rounds go up every blinds go up every what we say 10 minutes sure yep i'll go on record saying uh i've just come back from another successful month of poker in south lake tahoe where i took home all the money <laughs> so if i don't win this <laughs> <laughs> My pride will be in peril. <laughs> so I might be playing with sharks, and they might be trying to fool me. The last time these guys played, they played for five thousand dollars. When it takes all. <laughs> <laughs> and who won? Your mama. Technically, so technically, Cersei so won. Mm-hmm. That was what, Luke? 225. 225, eh? Heads up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Delicious and nutritious. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Didn't take that easy. You have to try again. 
Oh. <clears throat> yep, still the same hand. <laughs> Big sweet fuck over. Right, let's go 800. Will the river of doom bring for one of us? Oh, it's king. No club. No spade. No spade. No. All in. Cool. <laughs> oh, and. Oh. Seal the deal. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was the one fishing for uh, ah, the queen of spades. Okay, yeah, 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 spades. Yeah. So I was trying to, yeah, I was trying to buy you off. Yeah. You know, hold on. Not the house. Well, I'm gonna buy back in, right? This is a buyback. <laughs> <laughs> is this not a buyback tournament? I got a flight to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lucky than good. <laughs> I am both. <laughs> 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 but I was doing okay. Until you were doing great. Right. You yeah. you had you the me. money in with yeah, the me. with the better hand. You certainly did. That is the fundamental yeah. theorem of poker. Yeah. And I only had I only had three aces to catch up. <laughs> you dealt it. You dealt it. Well, thank you, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not all entertained? Did you enjoy today's <laughs> lesson? <laughs> so, uh, Yes. So that ended poorly for for the monkey household. Uh yeah. It's uh, <laughs> uh you 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 tried slamming in you tried you tried betting into me with a uh, a draw you didn't get there Christoph and it, I uh, smelled I smelled fishy decision making. <laughs> well, uh you smelled fishy decision making but what, what I think allowed you to smell that is that you had top pair it turned out. <laughs> uh yeah which is not necessarily a massive hand but uh yeah right you know, I, was, I was studying your betting patterns we don't show it in the video but about four hands prior you were betting pretty pretty small a third to a half pot with a made hand and in this hand you were over betting the pot so that smelled like weakness to me interesting because indeed i did want you out of the pot and I thought, you know, a six hundred dollar whatever was a it was a big uh, it was a big bet on the flop. You called, and in hindsight, that should have been all I needed to know. But I like a little continuation bet uh, every once in a while, and so I think I I uh, increased it. But of course, I didn't know you had top pair that that was kings. Uh, I had eight outs. Uh, with a club because I had the queen of spades. So I was uh, assuming that would be a made hand. So I had enough outs. I was playing aggressively because in part also you were you were in our small little circle betting very aggressively. So I, I ain't going to be, you know, letting you boss me around. I think I just <laughs> picked an unfortunate moment to sort of, you know, defend my honor and... Uh... <laughs> well, I uh, get get used to the taste of humbling defeat because the uh, King of the Jungle Challenge mm. is uh, going to be upon us in just a few months' time, and I think I'm still leading the way. Sizably so. So all three of my, of my little, uh, little pre-revenue companies <laughs> are, are struggling mightily. So this first year, I have made many mistakes. You have made many 
smart decisions, and I'm eating a lot of humble pie. It is certainly looking like the uh, year of the badger on the podcast. <laughs> what's that say? What's the what's the critter that you're wearing called? Rascal. I think, I think yeah, a rascal. I think uh, we uh, we bought me a beautiful hat from your favorite hat store in Austin. I think this is probably a raccoon, but we're going to call it a badger for the purposes of the podcast. Yeah, looks close enough. Looks untrustworthy. Looks devious. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, today's little catch up on our Austin adventures. We've got a few other little things we'll chuck on the YouTube shorts and uh, do check out my daily video posts on the Instagrams and the X's and the LinkedIn's uh, nearly, nearly at the finishing line now about to wrap up all my current holdings. And then on day 50, I'm going to share my full portfolio so you can see how I got to uh, where I am over the last 20 years as a professional investor. Looking forward to it. Side, quick side note on our, we didn't mention this, but on one of our two runs, one in which you nearly uh, killed yourself by tripping and falling <laughs> in the jungles of Austin and the other one, which uh, took us around the lake. Anyway, in our many hours of running together, you put the, uh, you put the little birdie of inspiration in my ear regarding Axon. So I am adding that to wise as as potential next investments. Uh, two fantastic companies. I think Axon is probably my highest conviction stock pick in the world right now. Very happy with that one. Yeah, we should we should highlight that because you you know, uh, I trust you. This is this is sorry, one more note. When you get to know somebody else and you know they're diligent and thoughtful and they tell you uh, you know, this is my highest conviction and it's not fluff because I know you didn't just hear it on X, you do the work. It really matters. So, you know, I'm not saying you, you will obviously be right, but once I, you know, do my own due dil diligence, I imagine more likely than not, I'm going to see what you see. So it's right. not a thing to take lightly, that kind of confidence. Well, if you do stick your monkey's paw in there, I definitely welcome any feedback be it be it positive or negative always good to understand both sides of a investment case sure the the one thing i that really resonates with me i'll say up front is the sort of goody two shoes uh aspiration of this company you know making policing more i mean safer and more reliable and less problematic to all in all the ways that policing can be problematic so i like it for from that angle that angle itself merits a lot of uh further diligence on my end superb and if nothing else right it's, i'm great to hear that you're thinking about adding a few stocks to your portfolio maybe coming out of your uh doom monger phase well, uh, either that or the moment I, I buy in, the market's going to crash. So be careful for what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We are on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. Uh, subscribe now for a finance podcast that's as fun and playful as it is insightful. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. <laughs> A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.